starting with a question. I am going to start with a question, but I thought about starting with a question that I would actually have you raise your hand in answer to. But I won't do that because I don't want to embarrass you. Plus, it's a personal question that I want you to be honest to, and I think you'd probably be more honest if you can be anonymous and just think about your answer rather than uh, let everyone see. So here's the question. Have you ever violated the sixth commandment? Now, I am referring, of course, to the sixth of the Ten Commandments that God gave through Moses. And of course, to answer that question, you have to know what the sixth commandment is, right? So maybe you don't know what that is off the top of your head. And so I'll give it to you. The sixth commandment in the ESV version that I'm reading from says very clearly and briefly, you shall not murder. The King James version, of course, has the more traditional, traditional thou shalt not kill. But I think murder is more appropriate for several reasons because there are some legitimate reasons to kill, but never a legitimate reason to murder. For example, there are soldiers who legitimately kill an enemy on the field of battle, but we don't regard that as murder nor a violation of this commandment. As long as that soldier is acting on orders from his superiors and the war itself is a just war. We might also bring in the whole debate about capital punishment. That is the state killing someone for crimes against the state or others. And while I'm not going to get sidetracked with that debate, I will say that when lawfully convicted and carried out, that does not qualify as murder. Then of course there is the issue of self-defense, the kill or be killed situation. We likewise would not regard this as murder, but a rare situation where someone is fighting for their life. I recall a professor I had in seminary that was a pacifist, meaning he did not believe in violence against someone else in any situation. And someone asked him one time in class, if you were in the unfortunate, unfortunate situation of a home invasion, would you protect your family against that invader, even to the point of death, for the one who has invaded your home? And he answered, no, I would not. And virtually everybody in the class thought that was nonsense. I mean, most of us would fight to the death in that situation with no moral or ethical dilemma whatsoever. And so there are forms of killing that don't qualify as murder. There's accidents where death was not intended, but unfortunately it happens anyway. And that's why our courts recognize lower forms of homicide like involuntary homicide. That is the unintentional death due to recklessness or death that even occurs due to low levels of criminal negligence. All of that to say, I don't like the general word kill. I prefer the word murder here. Because murder is an intentional act, an unlawful and premeditated attack resulting in the death of another. So with that as the definition, have you violated the sixth commandment? And I think most of us with those guidelines, perhaps all of us would say, no, I've never murdered anyone. Will that be in the case? I suppose we can wrap this sermon up and get out of here early today. If no one here has ever murdered anyone, then this passage of scripture must not apply to us. But it is of course not our definition of murder that really matters. It is God's and we are going to see that his definition is much more expansive than the definition I just gave you. And once we understand his definition of what genuine murder is, then every hand in this room will go up to the question, have you violated the sixth commandment? Because I'm confident every one of us indeed has. 
Now remember last week we looked at the general statements that began this section of the sermon, verses 17 through 20, and then we said that there would be six examples to follow, and obviously the example we are looking at this morning is the first of those six examples of how to put into practice in our lives so that we could have a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. First century Roman philosopher Seneca said, the way is long if one follows precepts, but short and helpful if one follows patterns. And what he meant by that was that examples are immensely helpful in applying the principles of how to live our lives. And that's what we're about to see, six examples. But the real reason I put that quote in there is because I wanted to sound smart. I wanted you to think that while you watch The Bachelor or some other nonsense show like that, I'm sitting around reading first century philosophers. So let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, as we tackle the topic of murder or reconciliation. Those are our two options. It doesn't sound like an either or option, but that's what it is. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Now from these verses, from the first two verses, we are going to see our expanded definition that murder includes anger. Now it's important to remind you at this point that this is not a new law. Jesus is not giving a new law, and in fact, in some sense, he's not even expanding an old law. We saw last week that Jesus very clearly said he came to fulfill the law rather than abolish it. So his interpretation of what the law had always meant is going to be what we see in these verses, and of course, it is going to go well beyond what they believe. But the initial law is not abolished, it is simply properly interpreted. The introductory formula that we will see beginning each of these six examples speaks of his authority to do this. You've heard that it was said, but I say unto you, no rabbi in their right mind would make a statement like that unless they had a death wish or they had the authority to back it up, which of course Jesus does. You certainly wouldn't want me starting something like that. You wouldn't want me to say, now you've read in your Bibles all of your lives, but I say unto you, you would run me out of here if I started saying those things, and rightly so, because I don't have the authority to make those kinds of statements, but Jesus does. So even as we delve deeper into these interpretations, we start with the fact that the actual act of murder is still a violation of the law. And in fact, Jesus says that such an act warrants judgment, something that is not in the initial command. I said the initial command simply said, you shall not murder or thou shalt not kill. But in Exodus chapter 21, the very next chapter, we find these words, whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. And then even as we talked about it a few moments ago, right after that statement, there are some qualifications. That is, if you strike a man but you did not intend for him to die, then there are some other judgments that are not as severe as death. And in fact, if it was an unintentional act, then there were some places somebody could flee. They were called cities of refuge. And there were judges and officers appointed to judge the cases to make sure that justice was, uh, was fulfilled. But that much is clear cut, or at least I hope so. Murder is wrong. So we want to focus our attention on the fact that murder includes anger. 
And to show the seriousness of this matter, notice that the consequences are identical. We see the same exact phrase. You shall be liable to judgment. In both cases, Jesus is saying we will face the death penalty. Or at least that's what we should face if we are guilty of anger. Now, anger, of course, is more difficult to define. Though we are guilty of this on all points at some time in our lives, it might start out as a mild irritation due to some minor annoyance or inconvenience. Someone interrupts the flow of your day as you had planned it out. Someone cuts you off in traffic. Of course, we know that that can easily rise to greater levels. That's why we have a name for it. It's called road rage. And it is a growing problem that often begins with someone cutting you off in traffic and you returning the favor. And failure to allow this to just move along causes more trouble. Most of us haven't chased anyone down the interstate. Probably most of us have not cut off someone else in return for them cutting us off, but we have said a few things in the car that only those in our car have heard. And such minor issues can accumulate and build to resentment. Here again, it might be unfair treatment or what you perceive to be unfair circumstances, but one piles upon another and then eventually it comes out as wrath or fury or rage. You just blow up. And you blow up at something very minor such that everybody looking around seeing this can't understand why your level of anger is far beyond whatever the situation was. It seems like an overreaction to the immediate circumstances, leaving those who witnessed it confused. Or in our day and age, perhaps videoing it and then putting it on the internet and referring to you as a Karen, if you're a woman. Now, I don't know what the corresponding term is for a man which is quite odd, isn't it? Because men in general have a much harder time controlling their anger than women do. And yet we have a term for the woman, but not the man. But Jesus is dealing with the heart, with the attitudes and the motives, because these are the things that build up to the physical act. But even if it never reaches that point, he's telling us it's still wrong. Even if we never blow up, even if no one else ever sees our anger, if there is an attitude or a thought within, it's not physical murder, but he says it is still wrong. Insults, criticism. So Jesus adds two other statements that from our vantage point seem a lot less serious than actual murder, and yet he lumps them all in together. The ESV has the, the next phrase as insults his brother. If you insult your brother, you are liable to the council. This is actually, a, the word insult is actually a transliteration of a word. And that's why the King James leaves it as raka. It's a very difficult word to translate again, which is why the King James doesn't. But it seems to be a word that simply means fool or empty headed. And who hasn't made such a comment? I confess I made a comment like this while writing this sermon this week. I mean, it's so easy to say, they're such an idiot. And then I thought to myself, but, but aren't you writing a sermon about this? And I was. The council, of course, is the word for the Sanhedrin, which was the highest court or ruling body in Israel. And then there is another word that is translated fool in the ESV, and some conclude that this has more to do with someone's character or morality, the first word referring more to someone's mind, and the second word referring more to their character. So the conclusion might be in this case the contempt for someone's mind or the contempt for someone's heart or character. And in this last case, it says they are going to be liable to the hell of fire which seems to imply to us eternal death rather than physical punishment. That's actually the word, Greek word Gehenna, which in the Old Testament was a site of human sacrifice by fire to the false god Molech. In Jesus' day, Gehenna referred to the, to the garbage dump outside the city of Jerusalem where they would burn their trash. And that was continually going. So when Jesus says, we'll be liable to Gehenna, 
It is quite possible that the people he is, that are hearing him say this can not only see the smoke rising, but smell it as he's talking about the punishment they deserved for such attitudes. Now, we could get bogged down here if we wanted to and try to distinguish between these three words, insults, anger, raka, fool. We could look at the little nuances and perhaps come up with some sort of sliding scale or escalation, uh, escalation. But I don't think that's what Jesus has in mind here. I think he just piles all of this on for emphasis. Now, if you want to get technical, we could also ask, well, who is my brother? Like we do in the Good Samaritan story, right? Well, who do I have to be a neighbor to? And I will admit that brother probably does refer here to a fellow believer, but I don't think Jesus is leaving the door open for us to insult anyone who's not a believer. As, of course, I think we'll see from the remaining verses. The emphasis is that the heart is the problem. And that is going to be the recurring theme for the rest of Matthew chapter 5. That it is not just an external action that others can see, but it is the problem of the heart, which is why our righteousness must rise above that of the scribes and Pharisees. And that's why he addresses anger and insults and attitudes and all of the other examples to follow. Now that doesn't mean that if you've ever called anyone a fool that all hope is gone and you are destined for hell. The point he is making is that once again, righteousness proceeds from the heart and external observance alone is never sufficient. And again, this is nothing new, but has always been the way God looked at things. Paul would later say to the Jews, hey, genuine circumcision is not a physical act. It's circumcision of the heart that really matters. God said in the Old Testament, when Samuel was looking to anoint a new king, God told Samuel, hey, don't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. So this has always been the case. Now, I do need to add here that not all types of anger are included in this statement. There is such a thing as righteous anger. We see this in Jesus. And we've made the point repeatedly recently that Jesus was sinless So Jesus did get angry, and yet he did not sin. Righteous anger is being angry at sin and the consequences that that sin causes. It's being angry when we see people who are disobedient to God and rebellious against him. We see righteous anger in the life of Jesus when he went into the temple and saw how it was being abused, and therefore he turned the tables over and ran the people out. We see righteous anger in Jesus when he said to the Pharisees, you're blind leaders of the blind. You cannot see the truth and therefore you're leading people into falsehood because they did not truly know God. It is when God's glory is diminished, when his name is defamed, these are the times when we ought to get angry. In fact, it can also be said that it would be sinful not to get angry in these kinds of circumstances. And yet we have to admit that the vast majority of our anger does not fall into the righteous category of anger. Instead, our angry, our anger usually comes when our name is defamed, when our glory is ignored or discounted, or when our desire is blocked. In fact, our anger tends to form from frustrations in our own lives. We are frustrated with some aspect of our life, maybe multiple aspects of our lives. And because we are frustrated, we lash out at others, taking our frustrations out on them and the circumstances around us. But regardless of the source, the issue is always the heart. And that is why Jesus is addressing it here. So we can't sit smugly back like the rich young man that Jesus talked to. When he said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him to keep the commandments. And he answered and said, I've kept all of these commandments all of my life. If you think you've kept the sixth commandment, then you don't understand the sixth commandment. So before I move on, lest I be charged with accessory to murder, while Jesus lumps all of these in together, there are different consequences when it comes to the action versus the thought. 
So don't take the approach that since you're already angry with a brother, you might as well take him out. There are clearly much greater consequences for one than for the other. So the question now that rises to our mind is what do we do about it? I think we could all agree that to one degree or another, we do at times explode in anger or at least lash out with harsh words for others. But even if you don't, and if you say you don't, I don't think you're being honest with yourself. You have to admit that there are thoughts in there that sometimes ought not to be there. Sometimes toward even those we love. Earlier generations used to say something like this about their children. I could just wring their neck. And most of you know what that means. It's the way a chicken was killed. And so they were saying, I could, I could treat my child like I would the chicken in the backyard. We may not use that expression any longer, but we might say something like, I could just kill her. We know we don't mean it, and we know we have no intention of actually doing it, but it does reflect the anger in our, in our heart at the moment, nevertheless. So at this point, we could talk about various strategies to remove the anger from our heart, to deal with the anger, and that would be a good thing and something, quite frankly, I've done in the past. But this morning, I want to confine myself to the text we are looking at, understanding that there are many other things we could say about how to handle our anger from other passages of Scripture, but I don't want to get into a topical solution to anger. I want to say what this text says. And this text says very clearly that reconciliation is better than anger. That the way to solve our anger in our heart issue is to be reconciled with those we have relationship with. And that we have a responsibility in seeking out that reconciliation. So this is in essence the positive side. We've dealt with the negative side. We ought not to be angry We ought not to hurl insults at people. Well, how do we move from that to the positive side? And that is we take positive steps of reconciliation toward those we come in contact with. And Jesus teaches this through two brief parables. The first one talks about being reconciled with our brothers. Reconciliation with our brothers. And again, brothers is referring to fellow believers here, not restricted to blood brothers. And so the parable is about a man who is at the temple offering his gift at the altar. I say temple because that's the only place where there was an altar and where they offered such sacrifices at the time Jesus makes this statement. So he says, while you're there in the temple making your sacrifice, if you remember that someone has something against you. Now, notice how that's worded. Someone else has something against you. The story does not tell us anything about the validity of the issue. That is, we don't know what it was, nor whether it's a valid claim. We simply know that there's a worshiper in the very act of worship who remembers that someone has something against him. And that is also not to say that if you have something against someone else, then you can sit back and wait till they remember it and then they come to you. It is stated elsewhere in Scripture that in that case, you still have a responsibility to pursue reconciliation. But here, you remember that someone has a beef against you. In other words, anger is building up in someone else's life because of some issue between you and them. And our response is not to say, well, that's their problem. They're the ones with the anger. No, our response is they have something against us, then leave your gift. In other words, stop worshiping and go handle this situation first, and then you can come back and worship. Now, I mentioned earlier that this was in the temple because I wanted to to emphasize just how urgent this situation is. Remember, the, the temple was in Jerusalem. And so for some of these who may have come from, let's say, Galilee up to the north, they may have traveled multiple days to get to the temple for the sacrifice. So they've traveled multiple days. Jesus now says, leave your gift and go. 
Now they've got to travel multiple days back, presumably, to deal with whoever it is has a problem against them. Then they got to travel multiple days back to the temple to complete their worship and then travel multiple days back home again. So this is, this is quite an experience here where Jesus is saying, this is such an important issue that even if it involves a week of travel in rough conditions, this is so significant, you need to take place, you need to take care of it and do so promptly. The point is the urgency and importance of seeking reconciliation with a brother or sister in Christ. Now we, of course, have it much easier. You can step out of the sanctuary when we're done here. And you can text someone, you can FaceTime someone, you can go old school and make a phone call. If the person's local, you could get in your car and drive over to their home very quickly and say, hey, we need to talk about whatever it is that's going on between us. And yet, in spite of the fact that we have much easier means of communication to deal with these issues, we tend to not communicate at all. Instead, we ghost, block, unfriend, ignore, or lob a a barrage of online assaults further damaging the relationship. And often in the sense of fellow believers, this also means we simply switch to another church. I mean, rather than doing what Jesus is telling us to do here, and that is go talk to the person and settle the issue and be reconciled, we leave worship and go worship somewhere else, never to return because that's simply easier. I can't tell you the number of times through the years that two people or two parties within a church or a local body of believers have parted ways because they don't or won't seek reconciliation. This is what has caused the majority of church splits. And some of you have experienced that. We sometimes call them church plants because that sounds nicer. But the reality is many of them started from a church split. Now, I'm not trying to say that every church plant or even the majority of church plants start from a split. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I am saying there are believers who rather than reconcile, split and go their separate ways. And likewise, there are groups in churches that do the same thing. So hear the importance this morning of reconciliation with other believers. It is more important than worship. Now, that's saying something. Because we were created and redeemed for worship. But if your heart is filled with anger, or you know someone else is angry toward you, then chances are you're not worshiping anyway, whether you're sitting here or not. And that's why this issue is so urgent. And that is why we must be proactive in weeding out anger, both in ourselves and in others who have something against us. And then there's a second parable. In the last two verses, the second parable urges us to seek reconciliation with our opponents or our enemies. Here, our story involves two men who are traveling. The text actually says that while they were on the way, the reason the word court is there is because the word accuser and judge imply that the two are on their way to court to square off in a trial. And based on the conclusion, it appears to be a civil trial over some type of monetary damage. Again, we have no indication of the validity of the case. Just the urging that it would be much better to settle out of court than to go through the process and and see what happens. And this leads us to believe that the person in question here is likely to be convicted of whatever, whatever the issue is. Now, in those days, if you were convicted of a monetary damage in a trial and you could not pay the damages, you were often thrown into debtor's prison. We don't usually throw anyone into jail for failure to pay other than perhaps maybe child support, but even that's after years and years of trying other things. Instead, we tend to try and garnish their wages, which certainly does seem to make more sense. After all, if you're in jail, You have very limited opportunities to make money in order to repay the debt. But no one has ever argued that court systems are efficient. So regardless of what you might think, this was the practice at the time, that if you could not pay the the settlement, then you were cast into prison until you could. 
And so the last sentence there says that you will be there until you pay the last penny. And the word there is a word that probably means something even less than what our penny represents. Again, stressing the urgency of the situation, the priority here is not to be proven right, if indeed even you are, and of course we always think we are. Nor is the priority getting a hearing so that everyone knows your side of the story. What is the priority? The priority is reconciliation with your accuser, your opponent. We'll talk more about this as we get to the end of this chapter where Jesus says we're we're not to hate our enemies, but we are to love them. Furthermore, the priority is not winning the case so that we are not out the money. In fact, let me just say it like this. Reconciliation is more important than money. You say, now you've crossed the line. The old folks used to say, now you've gone from preaching to meddling. We don't like people talking about our money. We don't like people telling us what to do with our money or how to handle our money. And we certainly don't like to admit that money is actually more important to us than we know it ought to be. But let someone defraud us or scam us or steal from us. And our righteous indignation grows. At least mine does. I mean, even if the monetary amount is not significant, if someone takes something from me that does not belong to them, I don't like it. And I can get very angry about it. I've had the experience that I know some of you have. Don't sit there and act like it never happens. You call that company up because they've charged you for something they weren't supposed to charge you with. And you get somebody on the phone and suddenly it rises to a level that you maybe never intended it to rise to, but you're angry and they're firing right back at you. Frankly, I've done this more times than I care to admit. And I've lost my temper in these phone conversations such that I don't even want to have the discussions anymore. I mean, I tell Tracy, you're going to have to call Comcast. I can't deal with them (laughs) because I've done it too many times. And I know for my own sanity, I just don't need to talk to them. Because it just happens, which is another reminder that no matter the medium, the principle remains the same. We simply cannot conclude that just because we're on the phone with someone and we're never going to see them face to face and they don't know who we are, that we can suddenly say or act any way that we want to act. Instead, our Christian values and heart for Christ and his gospel should control our thoughts and actions regardless of the medium. Now, again, all of this is easier said than done, isn't it? Which is why I was reminded multiple times this week, again, as I was writing this sermon, that I violated the very things I was writing, which is another reminder of just how radical this sermon is. The Sermon on the Mount, I mean, not mine. And how important it is to have the Holy Spirit guide us. But I also want to point us back to where, what we've already discussed and say there is a reason the Beatitudes come first in this sermon. Beatitude number one, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you're proud and you're arrogant, then you are never going to seek reconciliation with someone else. Or worse yet, you're not going to be willing to reconcile when they seek reconciliation with you. Unless you're living out the Beatitudes, you're not going to live out this passage of Scripture. And then, of course, we read, blessed are the peacemakers. I mean, isn't that exactly what Jesus is picturing here with these two brief illustrations? That we are to make peace with our brothers and peace with our opponents. And the urgency and importance of this. I mean, to say say that something else is more important than worship and money. That says what a high priority this is. Frankly, I thought about beginning this sermon with this phrase. Some of you shouldn't be here this morning. But I was afraid some of you might get up and and leave. But for a minister who always wants and prays for more and more people to come to worship, I don't say that lightly. But some of you shouldn't have been here. Because if you're following this text, there's a reconciliation that needs to happen between you and someone else that is a greater priority than even your worship this morning. Because we've seen that murder goes well beyond the act of killing someone without justification. It includes the heart, which again is the same refrain we're going to see throughout this whole chapter. 
It is not about merely external obedience, avoid killing someone. It's about the heart, which means my attitudes and my actions and my thoughts and my words toward others are a reflection of what is on the inside. Paul, in writing his letter of joy, that's the book of Philippians, he writes his letter of joy and yet he deals with a situation in the church with two ladies who were at odds with one another over something. And it's ironic that he ends his letter of joy by urging these two women to reconcile and urge the, urges the church to help them to reconcile. He writes this, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. This was brought up in my pastor's group this week that I am part of, which is why I'm including it here. Can you imagine one day getting to heaven and you run across Euodia and you say, where do I know you from? That name, that name sounds familiar, Euodia. Oh, uh, there's Syntica. That, that sounds familiar too. Syntica, where do I know you from? Oh, yeah. You two, you're the two from Philippi that couldn't agree, that Paul had to write about and say, these two sisters in the Lord who have helped me tremendously in the gospel need to come together for all of eternity. That's what I'm going to think of. There's Euodia. There's Syntica. You don't want to be that, do you? Be reconciled. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that uh, in the gospel, we can be reconciled not only to you through the sacrifice of Christ, but we can be reconciled to one another. I pray that we would set our pride aside and seek reconciliation, whether that's a fellow believer in Christ or whether that is uh, some accuser, some opponent. Lord, we know that your word acknowledges that that may not always happen because obviously to be reconciled with someone else means that they must be willing to be reconciled as well. But as far as it depends on us, let us seek reconciliation because you've reconciled us as enemies of God. You've reconciled us through Christ. May we live not filled with anger, but with reconciliation in Jesus name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.